Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jerry DiMaggio. I'll be serving as the moderator for today's webinar. I'd like to welcome everybody to the program. Uh, we're quite proud of our program here at Applied Research Associates. Now, today's program uh, is entitled Tools and Techniques for Pavement Evaluation. In my role as moderator, I'll be uh, discussing a few housekeeping details with you. Uh, later on, after the formal presentation, I'll be moderating the Q&A program and also telling you about how to receive your PDH credits and then also to get a uh, PDF file of today's presentation. Next slide, please. So first of all, if you're experiencing some difficulties, either audio or visual, first of all, check on your end that you're properly connected. If you have a problem, then uh, you can see in this slide just uh, click on the chat button and send us an email and we'll see if we can help you out. But I want to repeat again, please check that you have uh, everything connected well at your particular end. We have uh, estimated about 470 some odd sites registered for today's program. So a lot of potential for little glips and we have them occasionally, but not often. Next slide, please. So we have about a 10 to 15 minute window of time for a Q&A, as I said, uh, we'll handle questions and provide appropriate answers at the conclusion of the presentation today. Um, we do invite you to send your questions during the entire program, and some people have a little bit of difficulty listening to the presenters and watching the PowerPoints and formulating a question. I'll tell you more about if we run out of time, how we'll be able to accommodate questions that we can adequately get to. Next slide, please. So, next slide, please. It's my pleasure to introduce our two speakers. So we have a double team today, um, Mr. Paul Wilkie, and Paul is a professional engineer. He is the office manager in our Camp Hill, Pennsylvania office, and advanced degrees in civil engineering from two very prominent Canadian institutions, as you can see in slide four. And by the way, the slide numbers are located in the lower right-hand corner of the presentation, if you haven't noticed it. Paul's got uh, over 30 years of experience in geotechnical and pavement and transportation engineering design. He has done literally hundreds of uh, investigations, so it's, it's really a great pleasure to get Paul's sage wisdom as we go along here. Next slide, please. Assisting Paul in today's presentation is uh, Pertha Anna. And Pertha has got advanced degrees um, from several prominent institutions as well. She also works in the Camp Hill office, working with Paul uh, pretty regularly and other staff there. She has over four years of experience in pavement engineering and pavement management, and her expertise uh, is uh, multifunctional, but in particular, she's quite uh, versed in falling weight deflectometers and then sunny automatic pavement condition data and then the evaluation of that data. As you learn, if you're not a pavement expert, we get a pretty diverse group of audience on these webinars. There's lots and lots of data that's collected, got to be summarized, interpreted, and analyzed. So with that, I'd like to turn the program over to Paul, and I'll be back speaking with you at the conclusion of the formal program. Paul? All right, thanks, Jerry. Good afternoon. I hope you'll find today's presentation interesting. My goal for the presentation would be to provide sort of a broad overview of tools and techniques for pavement evaluation. What do I mean by tools and techniques? Well, there's a lot of different types of pavement testing that can be done and different approaches on how to do that testing and evaluate the data, and they're not the same for all projects. So I hope today, I, I'm, well, first I'm assuming we have a lot of civil engineers on the line and perhaps a lot of transportation designers that aren't pavement experts, so I hope after today you'll be equipped to select the appropriate tools and techniques for your particular project. And the, the presentation today is broken into two distinct parts. One is looking at the surface of the pavement, talk very briefly on conventional approaches, and then spend more time on some innovative approaches to evaluating the surface of the pavement. <clears throat> then we'll talk about subsurface evaluation, including both conventional cores and borings, and then some non-destructive techniques, including deflection testing, run penetrating radar, and some other specialized tools. So that was the goal of the presentation. 
So now, not to be confused, the next slide is on the goals of the pavement evaluation. So you're just starting a new project, you're doing a pavement evaluation. Some of the goals should be to quantify the pavement conditions and also the uniformity or variability of those conditions within the limits of the project. Even though, let's take a modest size project, a two lane road two miles long, that's a lot of pavement and chances are the conditions are not the same all the way through. We'd also want to identify the causes of the pavement problems or the distresses because uh, to use the medical term, we want to treat the root problem, not the symptoms like filling potholes. It's often useful to estimate the remaining life of the pavement. And then the investigation should pro provide the parameters or the data needed to identify the most appropriate rehab, which usually is most cost effective, and also the parameters needed to design it. The last point I wanted to make on this slide is to only collect the data that you use or that will you be used for decision making and that's not the same in all projects. And I'll explain some examples of this later, but sometimes as engineers, we fall into the trap of collecting data just because it's easy to collect and it's maybe not even necessary on some projects. So the components of the pavement investigation that we'll talk about today, each of these topics will be discussed. So on this slide, I'm just gonna kind of read through them. We'll talk about historical records review. We'll look at the surface of the pavement, both in terms of visible distresses, and then other features like roughness of the pavement, its skid resistance. And down below the pavement surface, we're going to talk about how to determine the composition of the pavement, its thickness, the condition of the pavement layers, and then the soil types and strengths. First then, starting off with a historical review, but by this I mean looking at as-built drawings to find out um, what does the pavement consist of, when was it built. Maybe you'll find one section was built uh, differently than another or overlaid more recently. And then sometimes you have the luxury of performance data. And what I mean by that is some type of objective condition assessment over the last few years. And in some cases, this may show that one part of the pavement is deteriorating faster than the others. That's useful to know. Traffic is always a necessary input to pavement evaluation. And in some cases, accident history, although that usually results or um, is used more in geometric design. And then finally, discussions with construction and maintenance personnel can be extremely valuable. And I want to give you one personal example that was a, a classic case for me a few years ago. It was a busy interstate highway, concrete pavement overlaid with asphalt. The maintenance people told me that they were frequently cutting out about a six foot swath centered along the transverse concrete joint because it was heaving. They would fill it with asphalt and then they were back every two years milling that asphalt down as it heaved up. So that caused me to suspect perhaps a materials related problem like alkali silica reaction in the concrete that can cause it to expand. We did some testing and found there were severe concentrations of ASR. We would have never got that from the as-built drawings. That was valuable information from interviews with uh, maintenance people. So now I wanna talk about condition assessment, looking at the surface of the pavement. And before I do that, I wanna step back just for one moment and distinguish between network and project level pavement management surveys. The reason I wanna do that is because some of the tools I'll be talking about soon were really developed for network level pavement management. They, I think they have their place uh, for project level. So what do I mean by network level pavement management? Well, it's looking at an entire road network. So maybe it's a city and it's got 300 center line miles of road. You're collecting data with the goal of getting sort of planning level of detail. You wanna be able to distinguish what road segments need major rehab, what may need minor rehab, and what year does it need it. So it's, it's really a, a engineering but a planning tool. Whereas at the project level, now we're looking in great detail at a discrete section of pavement, a few miles long, whatever the contract is, and it's part of the design process to identify the appropriate rehabilitation. So how would you do this surface condition survey? Well, there's a few methods to do it. <clears throat> Starting out with a good old fashioned windshield survey. And I, I still do these sometimes today myself. <clears throat> they provide an overall subjective assessment of the pavement. But if you can imagine driving along my example of a modest length project, two miles, human brain can only catalog and comprehend so much. It'd be difficult to go back in your mind saying, I think the middle third of this had different conditions than the other. So good for an overview, but not always enough detail to distinguish variability. The other extreme would be to literally map all of the distress on some kind of a drawing. This can be useful when you get to final design for concrete pavement restoration, where it is common in the plans to actually delineate exact locations of repairs and repair types. 
like Dalbar retrofits, full depth patches. So in this drawing that I have here, this is literally out of a project. These little squiggly lines are transverse cracks, transverse to the direction of travel. The shaded areas are full depth slabs, uh, slab replacements were identified. So this was very useful when it came to final design, putting it on the plans. But if you can imagine, this is just a tiny section of the project. Having this kind of information, if it was rolled out on a conference table, it might be 30 feet long. I think you'd border on information overload. How would you make decisions based on that? So I think you need different types of information to decide what rehab treatment is necessary. The next approach is sort of intermediate between the first two. And we call it a pavement condition index approach because the PCI is a single number to identify the overall condition of the pavement that I'll talk about in a moment. And that can be very useful in identifying different segments of variability throughout the project. So if you're doing this, you would first divide the project into sections or segments, or you may think of them as sub-projects, based on the pavement history. For example, if the first mile had a different time that it was constructed or was overlaid more recently, it would be good to treat that separately. Other things being equal, you would want uniform segment lengths because if we're quantifying the amount of distress, it's good to compare it on the same interval if it's, say, half mile, for example. Second would be to collect the type, quantity, and severity of distress, either measured or, or estimated with some procedures that are reliable. This can be used for repair quantities, but also useful from an overall standpoint in identifying what treatment is appropriate. And then a calculation of an overall condition in index can be useful in helping to identify the variability between segments. So what do I mean by the PCI? Well, this is a scoring system that was developed by the Corps engineers decades ago, and it creates a, an index from zero to 100. As you can see, zero is a terrible pavement and 100 is perfect. And suffice it to say that it's a composite rating of many different distress types that come into this rating. It recognizes, for example, things like alligator cracking. If you're not familiar with that, it looks like the height of an alligator. It's an indication that there is severe base failures down below. That's a really serious pavement distress. The other extreme might be cracking along the center line, which is just the paving seam opening up. So this score recognizes that some distresses are more severe than others. So how would you do a PCI survey? <clears throat> Again, there's a few methods that can be used, starting with the most simple, the foot on ground, literally walking the pavement, taking a tablet or a clipboard and documenting the, the distresses that you see. <clears throat> This isn't always feasible for a larger projects, so another method is the semi-automated digital survey vehicle. So here's something, a tool that was developed for network level pavement management, but can be very useful for project level as well. So in an automated way, it's collecting high resolution images that are then evaluated in the office. And I'll get to that in a moment, but first a little bit on the equipment. I have two images here. The one on the left is fairly new technology. The one on the right is real new technology or cutting edge, you could say. So this is a digital survey vehicle. On the back, there are cameras taking digital images of the pavement looking straight down. We have a right-of-way camera that's looking at 360 degrees all around the pavement. A series of labor lasers in this profile system at the front that's measuring roughness, rutting, and faulting. And then everything is tied geographically with the GPS so we know how, where everything is, all the data is collected. A modification of that is to use lasers instead of the digital camera it's taking things that look like pictures, but they're generated by lasers. Regardless which technology you're used, you're looking at either photographs or, or uh, laser-generated images that look like a photograph. A trained technician is looking at them on a computer screen in the office and identifying distresses. There's software that allows you to delineate the limits of this, so then it's calculating the area or the length for you in an automated way. So here's some images. I've mentioned the 360-degree camera. The Data can be processed so that you're looking in any direction. In this case, it's looking straight forward. And then here's the laser generated image uh, looking straight down. You can see the cracking there. The laser crack measuring system is very good at identifying minute cracks, even down to one millimeter in size. This example has three different uh, uh, codes, red, yellow, green, basically based on the thickness of the crack, giving it a low, medium, high severity and you can see it's quantifying the limits of each of those. So very good at distinguishing cracks that you might not even see with the human eye, and you can actually use the software in an automated way to quantify these cracks. However, it does not recognize crack patterns. 
The example I mentioned earlier is an alligator crack that's so much different and so severe compared to other types of crack. And this system, this LCMS, is not able to recognize that, at least not yet. A lot of people are working hard on algorithms to get there. So it requires some manual intervention. But that regardless, both systems, the digital survey vehicle or the LCMS, have lasers that allow you to measure rutting, roughness, and faulting. And as I mentioned, all the data is georeferenced so you know where the data was collected. So let's take a step back from that and compare the condition survey methods. Well, you've got the DSV LCMS compared to foot on ground. Similar end result, the DSV is definitely faster and safer because you don't have someone putting themselves in traffic because you can run the DSV at uh, traffic speed, actually. The DSV would typically be more accurate, although you could argue that physical measurements with foot on ground would be comparable. The DSV does provide georeferenced images, so you can actually go back and look at something again if you want. And as I mentioned, the lasers are correcting, collecting these profile measurements such as rutting and roughness. The foot on ground will cost less for small projects and is appropriate for areas with low traffic. So as they say in Missouri, show me. I thought the best way to demonstrate this is to give two examples, and I've chosen one that was a very comprehensive investigation and one that's a little bit simpler. The comprehensive one was I-95, the New England section of the New York Thruway. It's in the vicinity of New York City. You can see it's 84 lane miles total, enormous traffic volume. This is average annual daily traffic, 140,000, quite a few trucks, two different pavement sections here. Although they were built just a couple of years apart, the first one had 40-foot joint spacings in the direction of travel, and it was 10 inches thick. It was built with the conventional wisdom at the time. Just a couple of years later, there was a different vintage. It was 12 inches thicker, or 12 inches thick, but it also had 18-foot joint spacings, which was recognized to be a better joint spacing. We definitely saw variable conditions, and we did this investigation in two phases. The first was preliminary design, where the goal was really to identify what rehab treatment is most appropriate and the most cost effective. And then in final design, contract documents actually detailed repair plans or repair uh, locations. As you can see by this picture, it gives you a feel for just the extent of the traffic, three lanes in each direction here in New York City. So certainly uh, using a digital survey vehicle was safer here. Driving slowly in one lane, probably not very good. Stopping on the shoulder and getting out and looking at things. Well, as my friends from New York City would say, forget about it. You're just not going to do that. Not safe. So here's an example of some of the distress collected. And again, you can see the limits are digitized. They're red, yellow, green for low, medium, high severity. And another example of a tool that was developed for network level payment management, right away cameras are really designed to collect asset information like signs, guide rail, uh, back slopes, anything off the side of the road. But in this case, we provided the forward facing images to the transportation design firm so they could actually go back to the site to look at anything, pavement or non-pavement. They might want it to know where a catch basin was. They did not require specialized software. We just gave them a series of JPEGs or georeferenced. So instead of having the risk of playing a video during this presentation, I just have a series of still photographs that are 20 feet apart to give you a feel for what it would like be like to do a virtual drive through the project. It was very useful. The on 95 data was diced and sliced a lot of ways because we did a lot of analysis in this particular case. During preliminary design, we identified more than one rehab treatment was warranted in this case. We developed repair quantities and types that were designed by distress type and severity. For example, a transverse crack that was low severity, we thought we wouldn't need to do anything. If it was medium, we would do a dowel bar retrofit. If it was high severity, we would do a full depth slab replacement. So these quantities were used for preliminary costing that um, were generated in life cycle cost analysis to pick the most rehab, the most cost effective rehab treatment. In final design, because this was exposed concrete, we did actually provide repair details like I showed you on a schematic earlier. So this is the first of many charts prepared to help understand the enormous amount of data we collected. And I don't expect you to read all the details here. I'll point out the points that I'm, I'm trying to make. On the y-axis is number of slabs with the distress in each one mile interval along the project. And the, the bars are the number of slabs, yellow, red, yellow, green, meaning low, medium, or high severity with each distress type. And there are a number of different distresses here. 
So this was useful to get an idea what are the distresses that are most prominent? Are they, used, are they mostly low severity or high severity? But this is half the project from roughly mile zero to seven. Then there was a toll plaza and then another seven miles north of it. So there were really 12 charts like this. So somewhat useful, but kind of borders on the, the area of information overload as I just described earlier. So we needed to do something else to help delineate areas. One thing we took a look at is roughness. So there's a, a method that's universally uh, recognized. The International Roughness Index, essentially it's the number of inches of, of bumps or roughness in a mile of road. It's a measure of user satisfaction because let's face it, non-engineers, all they care about is whether the pavement is smooth or not. But if you are an engineer and you have, you're looking at distresses or problems in the pavement, usually if the pavement has problems, it's going to show up in terms of poor ride as well. So here's an example of IRI plotted versus distance in miles from zero to 14 miles. You can see a little bit of variability, but relatively uniform except for a spike here and a really big spike here. But what we learned afterwards is talking to some of the people that would maintain this road is that they were having a lot of faulting of the concrete joints that caused them to come in and do a diamond grinding, which makes the pavement really smooth every year or two. So that told me, well, we better not use IRI for making decisions in this case because it's been artificially lowered every couple of years. The spike in the middle is because they were not diamond grinding the toll plaza. So not all that useful for I-95, but I just wanted to point out that this can be a good screening tool on a lot of other projects. It's a simple parameter to obtain. The next thing we looked at was the PCI. And there's a plot of PCI versus uh, distance, or again, it's one mile intervals along the length of the project. <clears throat> so when I look at this, it reminds me of an organ with a bunch of pipes going up and down. There's some variability here. Maybe you can't make sense of much of the pattern, but if you look closely, there's two groups. The first group has PCIs in the 55 to 60 area, which is really kind of moderate to poor. And then the rest, there's a handful of spreads through the project that are very good condition, 95, 90 to 95 PCI. When we put the information together in this chart, this was an aha moment, I would say. This spoke volumes and was used extensively for our decision making. In fact, there's so much information on this slide, I'm gonna take a few minutes and walk you through it in some level of detail. First, the color coding. The rows that are colored blue indicate there was a recent asphalt overlay, AC. And here's the pavement age. It gives the PCI ratings. So the PCIs are in the 80s, 90s, pretty good. But what, told, what this told me is that all the rest of the concrete is bare. This area was overlaid. Why did they overlay it? Probably this was the worst section of pavement, and that's why they have to overlay it to keep it uh, serviceable. So we have to take that with a grain of salt to happen, the fact that it had high PCIs. This salmon colored or light orange color indicated that slightly more modern uh, generation of pavements, the 18 foot joint spacings are a little bit thicker. These are the ones that had the PCIs in the 90 range. And all the rest of it, the white colored rows, that was the older vintage, the 40 foot slabs. And you can see that's where the PCIs are in the 55 to 65 range. So what we have here is some really good sections of pavement. And these are a couple of miles sandwiched in between some pretty poor pavement and then periodically we have the overlays. So based on this, we decided this project definitely warrants more than one treatment. We need a different treatment in the, this area than in the rest of it. And then during final design, because it was bare concrete and some of the repair was full depth concrete slab replacements, we did identify those on the, on the drawing, something like the one I showed before. This is an actual excerpt from a drawing prepared from the consultant we were working with on this project. <clears throat> so that was a very comprehensive investigation of I-95. Now, I won't say maybe the other extreme, but definitely a simpler example was I-81 just north of Harrisburg, four lane interstate, less traffic, but still significant, huge percentage of trucks. The pavement consist, consisted of three and a half inches of asphalt built in 98, and then 10 inches of concrete beneath it with six inches of gravel subbase. So the limits are, or the scope of our investigation here was a condition survey, and then some falling weight deflectometer testing, which is one of the dis destructive methods of evaluating structures that we'll talk about, or Pritha will in, in a few minutes. So this picture just gives you an idea of what the corridor looked like. You can see there's the heavy truck traffic. Remember there's thin asphalt over concrete. So the first thing I did here 
is I went with the uh, the design project manager and we did do a drive through at about 50 miles an hour, 55 miles an hour. And it was apparent that almost all of the distresses were mirrored from the concrete joints below, the center line joint and the transverse joint. And some of them were so deteriorated that they did patching along it. So we decided rather than collect all kinds of data, all we're gonna focus on is the quantity and the severity of cracking along the longitudinal joint, the transverse joint, patching associated with it, and then any other cracking mid-slab. And we did use a DSV because it wouldn't have been safe to collect the data any other way. This is just a small sampling of the results, roughly every half mile. And we categorized, there's those five distresses I talked about, longitudinal and transverse joints, and then patching <clears throat> and other. So it's quantifying the, the uh, square footage or the length of low, medium, high cracking. So I'm gonna kind of save that idea for now. Krifton later on is going to talk about how we use this combined with structural testing to make decisions on I-81. But the point I want to make here is that the condition assessment was much simpler on I-81. So this is trying to make the point that all, not all projects require the same level of detail. PCI was extremely useful on the I-95 corridor near New York City in identifying segments of similar condition, would not have been very useful on I-81. But we still needed to quantify the information uh, on both of them. So a DSV with getting quantitative information was much better than just a subjective windshield survey saying that the pavement is in moderate condition. So that's kind of a, a recap of well, a lot of slides we went through talking about how to evaluate the surface of the pavement. <clears throat> in review, we talked about a windshield survey having its place for simple projects, or perhaps like I-81, it's the first step of a more comprehensive survey. The DSV, the digital survey val uh, semi-automated method, can collect a lot of information quickly and safely. And sometimes the PCI approach is warranted as it was in 95, but not in I-81. The stress mapping may be useful, especially if there's concrete repairs. If it's asphalt, it's not as common to identify specific repair locations. So now I want to transition to the next part of the, invest, the um, presentation, which is really all about sub, looking at the subsurface beneath the surface of the pavement. The purposes would be to identify what is the pavement consist of? What's the condition of the material? Is it cracked or badly deteriorated? What's the strength of the pavement and also the subgrade soil below it that's supporting the pavement? The methods we'll talk about are conventional cores and borings, dynamic cone penetrometer, California bearing ratio, some non-destructive methods falling weight deflectometer and ground penetrating radar. So almost every investigation would have at least some conventional destructive testing. Call it destructive because you're poking a hole in this pavement, which you want to limit that. It's also expensive to close the lane of traffic. It might take an hour to obtain this core and then another half an hour to advance a soil boring through it. If you're doing soil borings, it's common to use a standard penetration test. And if you aren't familiar with this, this is a test developed a long, long time ago, still used today. There's a 140 pound hammer drop, a standard 50 or 30 inch uh, height. And you're recording the number of blows to drive a, a hollow sampler into the ground each of these um, six inch intervals, and then the last two added together to get an end value of standard penetration resistance. So how would you determine subgrade strength? Well, the standard penetration test is widely used for foundation design. People like Jerry DiMaggio that introduced me do a lot of foundation design, and there's lots of correlations between the SPT and shear strength and other parameters for foundations. I've been at this game a long time and I have yet to find a correlation between standard penetration test and the parameters that are used in pavement design. So it, although it, it can, you can use some judgment, actually a, a low end value means poor soil, a high end value is good soil, but not a good correlation. Most design procedures use the California bearing ratio or a modulus, a resilient modulus. And you can test a CBR in the lab. So this is one of my pet peeves. <laughs> being a pavement guru, working with civil engineers that know much more than I do about a lot of subjects. But when it comes to pavement, they know that CBR is a direct input to a lot of methods of pavement design, so they want to run a CBR. And I have to remind them that this can be misleading because to do this test, you're taking a disturbed sample from the field, usually a pail full of material, reconstituted in the lab to a standard density level, with a controlled moisture content, and then you're testing the strength of it. 
So if you're reconstructing a pavement, this would be very indicative of what the soil would be like. But if it's a um, pavement that's been in place and you're rehabilitating, it may not represent the conditions at all. The dynamic cone penetrometer test is one similar to the SVTX or driving a solid cone into the ground. It can be done handheld or with the equipment. Similarly to the standard penetration test, you're looking at the resistance of how quickly you can drive it into the ground. And this does have a lot of good correlations to CBR. So next we'll do the subsurface investigation. We talked about destructive ways. Now we're gonna talk about non-destructive testing. And I'm going to let Pritha take that part of the presentation as soon as I pass control over to her. Thanks, Paul. We will now look at the non-destructive methods of subsurface investigation, which are the falling weight deflectometer and ground penetrating radar. Uh, the FWD is primarily used for structural evaluation and the GPR is used to determine uh, any anomalies in the layer thickness and other indiscrepancies. Now, on this slide, the top left picture shows a van hauling the FWD trailer, and the picture on the bottom right shows the load plate that drops weight and the various sensors picking up deflection data. This slide shows a deflection basin curve and illustrates that the deflection below the load plate is the greatest, as you can see, and it tapers off as you move away from the load plate. Since we know the size of the load plate, the load applied, and the measured deflections, using iterative processes, we can calculate the modulus by these stress over strain values. Um, so this is a table that shows the raw FWD output. Uh, so on the raw, raw output, you see that you get a location, the load applied, various deflection values, uh, temperature and GPS coordinates. Now, just for illustration purposes, I have deflection from sensors D1 to D4, uh, but usually it's, it's normal to have anywhere from nine to 12 sensors for testing. Um, to get modulus values, you need to use certain bag calculation techniques. These calculations are iterative in nature and based typically on the elastic theory and boston nix equations where you're trying to match predicted basin values with the actual values. The required inputs for running these equations are pavement layer thicknesses and uh, the load and deflection data. The SWD has numerous uses, such as uh, to evaluate variability of overall pavement strength, um, determine strategic core and boring locations. So if you want to alienate weaker sections and then uh, go and do some cores instead of punching the pavement with lots of holes. Determine subgrade soil strength, so you use iterative bag calculations to get these values. Uh, structural adequacy and remaining life, you can get your structural number values um, and a lot of parameters for overlay design as uh, done through ASH 293. For concrete pavements, if you want to check for any voids in the pavements, it's extensively used. And another very important application is to calculate the joint load transfer, which we will talk about in detail. Now this chart shows a simple example of structural capacity that can be measured in various ways. Uh, and here it's plotted against distance. So as you can see that there are two distinct six segments section one and two with different structural capacity values. Now structural capacity is higher for section one, so we know that it is stronger than section two. Here is a chart of deflection versus station. So overall deflection values give you a feel of what is happening on your site even before you run any bad calculations. Now higher deflection values are bad and lower values are good, hence the right part of the chart is much weaker since it has much higher deflection values. Now here's a chart that shows modulus versus station. Results of iterated by calculation yield a resilient modulus. Now depending on the type of software or process you use, you can get different moduli values. Uh, this plot shows uh, structural number plotted with stations. 
the structural number gives an indication of combined strength for all pavement layers as used in ASHTRA 93 for overlay design. So earlier Paul talked about correlating DCP values to CBR and how CBR is an important parameter and everybody kind of understands what it is. Now with that calculation, you get a resilient modulus, which can be correlated to CBR. And like Paul explained, the CBR can then be correlated to your DCP. So this is a good way of doing some uh, non-destructive evaluations. Um, the E value of asphalt that's back calculated from the FWD data may be used with common correlations, such as this one that's shown on the chart to determine the structural layer coefficients that are then used for each individual layer to determine the overall effective structural number of the pavement structure. So far, we've discussed what the FWD is and its various applications. We'll not now talk about determining where and how the SWD test locations should be placed. Now, usually testing is done in the outer lane. If you are testing both lanes, as you can see in the schematic, it's good to stagger your test so that you cover more area. Generally, points are laid out every 100 to 500 feet intervals. Sometimes there's a need to go back and test again, so the first round of testing can be done to isolate any bad spots, and the second round can be done to kind of close in and test the bad spots with even less spacing, you know, instead of, again, punching core holes. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the joint load transfer evaluation in concrete pavements. Um, so this helps, it finds lots of applications in picking the right rehab alternative for composite pavements or rigid pavements. The first uh, picture is just your FWD um, van with the, F, hauling the FWD, and the second picture is a reflection crack coming up on the uh, HMA surface that's originating in the concrete pavement below. We'll take a closer look at the load transfer mechanism in rigid pavements. Load is transferred from one slab to the next with the help of dowels, and when there are no dowels present, then aggregate interlock aids load transfer. In the top picture, we see that the load is applied on one slab, so it deflects, but the adjacent slab has no deflection as a result of the applied load on the first slab. This indicates that there's no load transfer, and this may be due to the dowel being loose and broken, uh, now, the second image, on the other hand, shows that the adjacent slab has 100% load transfer. So usually, you know, in life, you'll see that uh, the load transfer is somewhere in between. It's not 100%, it's not perfect, and it's not 0% as well. Most agencies use 65% load transfer as a passing. Um, on this slab, we see moderate cracking on top, but a lot of cracking below, which uh, this is where an SWD comes in. Now, there are instances where a dowel bar might be sheared or corroded, in which case there's no longer good load transfer. And just looking at the top of the surface, you can see that you can be fooled and think that your pavements are in good condition, whereas they might not be. Uh, this, sli this slide is an expert of deflection data taken from a large project. So joint efficiency is calculated by um, doing a ratio of the deflection for both sides. It's calculated both for the approach and the slide of the slab, and they both together should be above 65%. As you see, uh, the second point uh, passes because both the approach and leave are above 65%, whereas the last one, even though the approach side is above 65, the leave is not, and it's considered to fail. Uh, this table shows a summary of all tests on the I-81 northbound and southbound travel lane. Paul talked about this project earlier and how the severity of transfer scratch was used to determine um, a repair methodology. So we tried to kind of come up with a formula as a broad brush to calculate the amount of pavement patching that would be required. 
Uh, this is a combination of medium and high severity transverse cracks times the number of joints that failed over the given slab area. This came up to be about 6%, which we considered as a very high percentage of patching from an economic standpoint. So we did not end up doing any isolated repairs, but did uh, an unbonded overlay on this project. Um, FWD finds application even during construction. Some agencies will have FWD dust testing done during construction, like the Ontario MTO and PennDOT. They all require contractors to uh, test after the HMA overlay has been removed and the bare concrete is exposed. Uh, this is an important slide as there's a number of agencies that have guidelines for full depth concrete repair. This particular matrix is taken from the Ontario MTO and it shows the importance of transverse cracks and load transfer for choosing a repair alternative. Now, as you see in the first block, that screen where your load transfer is above 70% and your transfer cracks are very narrow. So you don't really need to do a full depth repair. Now coming to the second block, you have an okay average load transfer between 50 to 70% uh, and smaller cracks. So, you know, you probably want uh, to consult other data, maybe do some cores or look at the surface distresses. But the last block is red, and this shows that when you have very small transfer scrap cracks, but bad low transfer, you want to do a full depth repair. So if you look at uh, the block that says uh, when you have great low transfer, but really bad transfer cracks at higher than 25 millimeter or one inch, then irrespective of excellent load transfer, you still want to go ahead and uh, maybe consider doing a full depth repair. Okay, so now we're going to talk about the ground penetrating radar. GPR has been used extensively in the last couple of decades, and I'm not an expert on this, but many of you may have attended uh, a similar presentation by Joe Ryder a couple months back, so I'm just going to give a really quick overview on this. The basic principle of a GPR is that electromagnetic energy is imparted to a surface and signals are reflected back based on their dielectric properties. Now there are three types of GPR. The first one, as you see, is the aerial antenna. This has a lower frequency, so it doesn't go as deep. That means it has shallow penetration, but it's more detailed. You know, it's used for pavement structure determination. The second one, the ground couple antenna, they go much deeper, so they have higher frequency, but then their outputs are less detailed. So if you're looking for sinkholes or compromised pipes or there are big cavities, then you might want to use this. The third one, the portable unit, uh, works like the first aerial antenna. One of the applications of GPR that we discussed is that they determine areas of varying asphalt thickness. Uh, you need some amount of expertise to interpret the output as well, but as you see, the varying layer thicknesses from these squiggly red lines, um, so you know that, you know, your asphalt is higher or is deeper at one section and then it's shallower on the other part. Uh, the chart on the bottom right shows a comparison of a GPR trace and core thickness plotted together and how the GPR can supplement data from the cores. So again, it's much better than punching multiple holes in the pavement. Uh, similarly, on this slide, GPR traces can also be used to determine variability in granular thicknesses, as you can see with the green squiggly lines. Uh, now this slide shows a planned view of a composite pavement section. There are a few transverse cracks on the pavement, but nothing significant. However, the GPI trace shows that there are deep asphalt patches placed every three to six feet. The white arrows show the location of these patches. This indicates that the pavement is seriously compromised and that one shouldn't be fooled looking just at the surface distresses. Now we've talked a lot about uh, different techniques of pavement evaluation, but what's the correct sequence? So. First, you want to start with a surface and get investigation, like a condition survey that Paul talked about, and there are various methods that you can use, and you can isolate some areas that you want to further examine. 
And then you can examine those areas with some subsurface investigation techniques like the GPR and FWD. Lastly, to supplement your GPR and FWD data, you could do some pavement cores and soil borings. I quickly want to go through two other specialty tools for pavement investigation, the magnetic imaging and friction testing. Magnetic imaging tools work on this uh, basic principle that they emit and detect any magnetic field. So any ma metallic object within the proximity of the scan unit, they can be identified and measured. There are two basic types. One of them is the mid-scan T that determines asphalt thickness by detecting a metal disc that's placed before paving. This finds extensive use in construction QA testing. The second one, the mid-scan 2, uh, determines the spatial location of dowel, dowel bars. So if there's any spacing or misalignment issues, this is when it comes handy. The last one is the skid resistance test or the friction test. Now this gives us a very useful parameter that a lot of agencies use, and it consists of a van pulling the skid trailer, as seen in the image, much similar to the SWD. Now, tests are performed at 40 miles per hour under flooded conditions. So you see this hose kind of pointing to the tire. Um, so that's where your water gushes out and your tests are done under flooded conditions. Uh, you can use a smooth tire and or a ribbed tire, and there are ASTMs depicting the test procedures. I'm going to pass control to Jerry now to wrap things up. Thank you, um, Paul and Pritha. That was fantastic. We have a large number of questions. I'll get to that momentarily, so don't leave us. We'll conclude right at about 1 p.m. I'd like to share with you, um, those of you who have been are new to the program, we've got uh, upcoming webinars usually delivered on about a monthly basis, depending on schedules and holidays, of course. You see in slide 79 the webinars that will carry us through um, the end of September, and we've got our program pretty well organized through November of this year. So uh, if you look at the titles, I want to mention that we, we try to offer a diverse range of topics. I call your attention in particular to two, which are uh, away from the pavement area, so to speak. They're not focused on uh, pavements per se, and the COVID-19 presentation by two of our experts in risk management and program delivery uh, are going to be the co-presenters there. And then Mr. D'Angelo will be following up in June with um, project bundling, and, and that's kind of an odd title. So and the odd title is that you have a number of small projects, and how do you optimize and partner with your neighbors to get the most for your, your buck? So with that, let's go to the next slide, please, and we welcome you to join us on all those programs. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, in slide 80, just a reminder, uh, you probably have some friends or relatives or associates that missed some of the previous programs. We've been offering programs since February of uh, 2019, and you see a few here that are referenced. We have uh, recordings for a large number of our presentations, and you see the access to the locations of where you can uh, log on to those. Uh, if you want to know more and you have any questions about uh, ARA webinars, I'll give you a website in a moment. Next slide, please. So Paul and Pertha have been gracious enough to kind of share their emails with us, and I can tell you right out of the gate that we're not going to be able to get to all the questions uh, today, unfortunately. That's, that's the bad news. The good news is we have a multitude of questions, so let's get quickly to that. Uh, number one, is it possible uh, to obtain, other than for cracks, the stresses like raveling and patching and bleeding when you're using an LCMS? Yes, I'll take that question, Jerry. That's a very good question. And yes, it is possible to get raveling and bleeding and other distresses with LCMS. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the beauty of LCMS is it can 
catalog or capture all this information in an automated way without any human intervention at all. However, the state of the practice isn't still quite there yet. Graveling, for example, can be looked at in terms of texture. If it's a very rough texture, you can assume that there's some graveling there. But uh, there needs to be some manual quality control to, um, to verify those. And at the project level, I would say there needs to be a healthy dose of uh, manual intervention with trained technicians looking at images. If you're doing network level payment management, then it may be close enough in a lot of cases. Okay, thank you, Paul. And uh, due to the multitude of questions, we'll, we'll try and give brief answers. And then I want to remind everybody, slide 81, you have your email addresses of Paul and Pertho, so you can, often there's follow-up questions, feel free to email them as long as it's pertinent specifically to the topic. So the next question is, uh, are you aware, uh, the presenters, of any study that reports on the precision of LCMS in detecting cracks of different widths? Um, there are a number of studies that have been done. In fact, ARA even did one, I believe, in Illinois a few years ago. I don't have firsthand knowledge, but, um, yeah, there's a, there are a lot of studies that have been done in, in terms of the accuracy, the repeatability. As I mentioned, it's an evolving technology. Actually, automated crack detection in some way has been around for more than a decade, maybe even two decades. And uh, the state of the practice just was not there a decade ago. It's getting much closer today. But still not there, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of recognizing certain patterns of cracking that are important at the project level, like alligator cracking and other um, types of cracking or potholes. For example, it can have difficulty distinguishing a manhole cover from a pothole is one example of how the LCMS can be fooled. Again, there's continuous work on refining those algorithms to combat those kind of um, deficiencies, but they, they still exist today. So far, okay. the two questions I would say are very pertinent to network level, but again, I wouldn't use the LCMS in an automated way for project level uh, to much extent. Okay, so next question. I'm gonna jump around a bit here if I can. So uh, how can we um, use the FWD layer modulus? Can that be related back to laboratory measure resilient modulus? Uh, yes, can it be related back to lab resilient modulus? Yes, there are established correlations between the FWD um, eval, we call it, modulus, and then resilient modulus in the lab. Um, I think Pritha might have touched on this earlier. She talked about relating it to CBR because that's such a commonly used parameter that it can also be related to the resilient modulus for pavement design. Okay, and the next question, um, how can we relate the remaining service life and easel um, using FWD data? How can we relate the FWD data to remaining service life? Yes, well, if you remember one of the slides Bertha talked about was a structural number. It gets an effective structural number. So a new pavement has a series of different layers, each with in individual strengths, and those strengths all added together culminate in a structural number. That's when it would be newly constructed, but over time with a series of cracking and, and deterioration, that structural number can degrade. So the FWD produces a parameter after back calculation it indicates the effect of structural number, and from that you can determine the remaining easels or equivalent single axle loads that that pavement is expected to take before it fails. Okay, next question. How to estimate um, severity of distresses using semi-automatic pavement imaging system for calculation of PCI? As per the questioner's experience, it's difficult to collect severity information. Uh, yes, as I, um, one of the slides talked about low, medium, high severity as defined in terms of the width of the crack. I mean, alligator cracking, it, it's more uh, how the pattern changes, but for other cracking, low, medium, high is distinguished based on the thickness of the crack. And the LCMS is actually quite good at determining that because it does find every minute 
crack, and it does determine the thickness of the crack with some pretty good reliability. The biggest deficiency is the lack of recognizing patterns that, that uh, a trained engineer would recognize when they see it with the human eye. Next question is, uh, what's the measurable transverse range of an ROW camera or a 360 degree camera? The measurable range of the right-of-way camera. Yeah, I would um, say that's a radius, right? I guess is another way to say that, if I'm interpreting mm -hmm. correctly. Well, first I'll have to say that, um, you want to take that one? I, I'm not um, an expert on that per se. I do know that, I mean, it can see it a long distance. It's a matter of how how much resolution you get. Um, obviously, the further out there, the less resolution. So I'm not sure if that answers the, the question, but first of all, it can see the complete panoramic 360 degrees. The further out you get, the the more pixelated or the, the lack of detail that you would have from clarity of the image. Okay, thank you, Paula. A, a frequently asked question in all the webinars, I'll answer this myself, is can the slides be made available? And as I mentioned, and I'll remind you with the final slide I show you today, we can, you can download a PDF version of the presentation. The actual PowerPoint slides we consider intellectual property, and unfortunately, they're not available. The next technical question, uh, the width and a uh, bit of a long question, so I'll try to articulate it clearly. The width and length of the crack might be closely related to the severity of the stresses, which, make, which makes it less important for the type of crack to be re relevant, and, and that's kind of a question. Mm -hmm. uh, the width and the length of the crack can be determined. Could you repeat so, it again, so, Jerry? The second. Yeah, part? sure. It's uh, it's it's a uh, and, and let me. It actually has two parts, so maybe the second part will help. The width and length of cracks might be closely correlated to the severity of the distresses, which make it makes it less important for the type of crack to be relevant. And it's, it goes on, it's hard to imagine that an allocated cracking area with one millimeter cracking width without running could be, will be an indication of a base failure. Yes, that's true. An alligator cracking would be a good example where the length and width of the crack are less important than other features. For example, if an alligator cracking a number of parallel cracks is an indication of the early phases of alligator and it would be considered light severity, whereas it progresses to high severity um, alligator cracking, it's more interconnected polygons and there can even be some rutting and pumping associated with it. So other, other uh, characteristics are more important in that case than the length and the, the width of the crack. Okay, and next question is a short and sweet one. How would you define good, fair, and poor roads in terms of IRI? Good, fair, and poor, okay. Uh, I feel like I should have these numbers memorized, and I don't exactly, but as I recall, uh, above 70 is pretty good for newly constructed pavements. Um, I'm sorry, below 70, a low number is good, a high number is bad. But don't quote me on that. We may have to, I mean, that's a simple parameter. It's um, a very defined thing by FHWA. I'm going off the top of my head. 70 to 200, yeah, I think it might be 70 to 200. 70 is, is definitely very good for a newly constructed pavement. Yeah. On the okay. IRI, I, I just covered it very quickly earlier, but it's really accumulating the number of small deviations from a perfect plane over one mile, and that's how they define the International Roughness Index. Although you can average it at much closer spacings, sometimes when we're trying to categorize different sections of the, the project for uh, looking at the variability, we may do, for example, 10th mile, so the IRI is calculated on based on an average of all the measurements in a tenth mile. The measurements are actually made every few millimeters as you go down the road. There's so much data, it's average to get an average inches per mile to define IRI. Okay, very good, Paul. And we do have a number of questions remaining that uh, we, we didn't have an opportunity to get to. And we do have them recorded and we have the source of the questions. So I'm sure Paul and Bertha will be gracious enough to respond to you individually. Uh, next slide, please. 
So um, if you'd like to obtain, and you haven't already, obtain a PD, uh, a P, uh, your PhD, sorry, P the H certificate, professional development hours certificate for the presentation, just send an email to the email address that you see here. And then next slide, please. We should have one more, I believe. Yes, okay. So just uh, we're ARA is a, is a national firm, about 1,200 professionals. Uh, we're always looking for great people. Uh, I've listed one of our uh, career sites here. That particular web site only lists the current vacancies, so you can make application directly by that site. We'll be setting up, uh, if you join us regularly on a monthly basis shortly, and I hope by next month, we'll have another source where you, if you uh, are not, you're interested in ARA and learning more and potential for joining for us, joining with us, and you can actually submit a resume that will be looked at by one of our professionals, but we don't have that set up just now. So on behalf of the speakers, uh, and I want to thank you. On behalf of ARA, I want to thank you. Please stay very safe, very healthy. We're all going to be back to normal very soon. Have a great day. God bless you.